All right, so we're going to go ahead and cover 26.4 today. I realized after I had clicked upload to my last video, much to my chagrin, I forgot to mention when I was talking about surviving nuclear weapons, um, in the early days of the Cold War, there were all sorts of pamphlets and films and such produced. One that has become uh, legendary, so to speak, in, in Cold War history is Duck and Cover. Um, Duck and Cover was a film made in 1951 to be shown to school children. And it's, it's become quite popular over the years in my class. I always show it. It starts out with a little cartoon introduction with Bert the Turtle. Um, and it teaches you all about how your best bet is to basically do what we do in a tornado drill. Um, so that's the thing I like to do with it, too. I like to show how there's a lot of similarities between how you... How basically it seems like every disaster, it's the same operation. Get away from glass, curl up in a ball, cover your neck and head, you know, and pray. Um, but I put a link on YouTube to this this film, Duck and Cover. It's only about nine minutes, so... If nothing else, some of you might get a kick out of the fact that maybe your your grandparents or whatever watched it. Uh, my parents actually remembered it. My father's a little too old for Duck and Cover. Um, by the time it came out, he was in high school. But my mom remembers them uh, being shown that in grade school. And so it, it's not just something that's like buried in a vault. This was actually shown in schools. But anyhow, for what that's worth. So let's actually get started with 26.4. We're going to basically cover the um, nineteen, the nineteen fifties up through the nineteen sixties of the Cold War. Basically, this this unit, I started out talking about how we were going to cover the Cold War, which is a bit of a, a mislabel. I'll be honest. The Cold War runs from nineteen forty six to nineteen ninety one, depending on who who's defining it. Uh, chapter twenty six really only gets us up to nineteen sixty. So. You're really only getting about the first third or quarter of the Cold War, but anyhow. So, 1952 election rolls around, and, and the American people feel it's time for a change. First of all, Harry Truman decides not to run again. Harry Truman could have ran, but he'd had it. His second term had been anything but a victory lap. During his second term as president... We had watched Eastern Europe firmly come under the grasp of the Soviets. The Soviets had developed the atomic bomb. The communists were victorious in China. We were embroiled in what looked like a no-win situation in Korea. Harry Truman is tired of the criticisms, tired of the arguing, and he decides not to run. The Democrats nominate uh, Illinois Governor Adlai Stevenson. The Republicans nominate Dwight D. Eisenhower, nicknamed Ike. Eisenhower, the hero from World War II, the man who was in command of D-Day and, and led all forces in Europe during the later portion of World War II. He is the Republican nominee. Adlai Stevenson was a brilliant politician, a very charming man, um, wonderful speech giver, um, wonderful speaker. I can't believe I just used the expression speech giver. I apologize. But He's running up against a World War II hero. Um, and since Americans feel like we are in a, a new kind of war, what, what better person to lead us than a man who's been through a real war, right? There was this belief that Eisenhower is going to know how to lead this country through this conflict with the Soviets. And so he wins by a landslide. As you can see in the Electoral College, it's not even a competition. Um, in the popular vote... It's, it's not quite the runaway it is in the Electoral College, but winning 55 to 45 is still pretty sizable margin if you think about it, right? Oh, wait, i got to get a county by county in there, Hank. Yes, we might be in the midst of a global pandemic, but that won't stop us from getting county by county. I do want to point out there's a little flaw here. Uh, I didn't make this map, but um, actually, yeah, hang on. Yeah, I don't know who the Joker was who made the last map, uh, but they, they reversed the colors. They made the Democrat red and the Republican blue, and then that makes the county by county not line up. I apologize. We got it all good. We're good. There'll be no more interruptions. So as you can see, <clears throat> um, the county by county, right, 
Yeah, the South votes Democrat. Apparently, South Carolina found out that there's a Republican Party. Who knew, right? This is like the first time that South Carolina has not voted all Democrat since, like, Andrew Jackson. Um, It's okay. Georgia took over for him. But as you can see, the South is really the only place where the Democrats get any votes. If you're curious, um, out where I live in Boone County, we voted Democrat. Kenton County voted Democrat. But Bob Rowe and friends over in Campbell County um, that and Caleb Jacob, they all voted for uh, Dwight Eisenhower. So, And Rodig and friends over in Cincinnati, they voted for uh, Eisenhower as well. So... As you can see, Eisenhower wins, right? Running on again his reputation as a as a hero of World War II. Although I will point out, unlike some people who kind of do the whole "I'm, I'm a combat hero," uh, Eisenhower does have the advantage of pointing out he he managed the military, right? So he's not just some guy who's like been in combat. He knows how to run a massive organization like a multinational military invasion. So anyhow, Eisenhower gets elected. Now, Eisenhower, again, professional soldier, spent his entire life in the military. It's all he's ever done. He went to West Point, graduated from West Point, served in the Army, end of discussion. Um, So he's a professional soldier. But he had a very different view of things than, than some of his predecessors. He understood how costly war is. right? And I, I'm not just talking the actual graves at Arlington. Right? I'm talking about he knows how expensive war is and how war can sap in a country of its resources, of its wealth. He came to understand that the Cold War is not just about who's got the bigger army, right? Because at the end of the day, if you think about it, if you've got a huge army, the only way to win is to use that army, right? Armies are only oh so good. At some point, you got to use it or lose it, because if you don't have the money to pay for that army, you're going to fall apart, right? He understood that in a long-term standoff like the Cold War, yes, you need military strength to keep the other guy in check, but the Cold War was a battle of economics, and it really is if you think about it, because the ideologies are about economics. It's about the economic model. Capitalism is a certain economic model. Communism is a different take on economics and how the economy should be structured. He understood that that's what the Cold War is. It's a new type of war. It's a war of ideas. Yes, it's a war of military strength and power and threats, but it's also about projecting your economic model and and proving that your model will work. Okay? And so in his eyes, we've got to show the world that our system is better. It produces more prosperity. That, you know, pound for pound, you'll get more out of capitalism. And the idea was, if you can get people to see the benefits of capitalism, they will join you instead of becoming allies with the communists. And also, the more economic prosperity that both the United States and the world has, the less appealing communism is, and you will be able to defeat it that way as well, right? Contain it. You don't have to use military force to contain communism. You can use the power of the dollar, so to speak. Now, again, being a professional soldier, he understands that war is very, 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 very expensive. Um, And he said, as as he said, we cannot defend the nation in a way which will exhaust all of our economy. He proposed the new look defense policy, as it was called. Okay, that was actually his term for it, the new look on defense policy. Here, we'll write it for fun. New look. I've been teaching my son at home. For those of you who are wondering where lowercase letters suddenly came in, I do know how to write them. I just usually don't, but I'm having to with homeschooling a first grader. Um, (laughs) Anyhow, he proposed the new look defense policy. Instead of a big, expensive army, he said we must be prepared to use atomic weapons in all forms. Because nuclear weapons gave us, and I quote, more bang for the buck. Okay? Think of it this way. And I'll show you a couple pictures here in a moment. I'm not going to exhaustively go through it all. Again, I'll make a, I'll make a whole presentation on nuclear war. But if you think about it, 
<clears throat> once you've cracked the secret of making nuclear weapons, which the Manhattan Project did, right? Once you get through all the science and you work out all the kinks, and now you're ready to just mass produce nuclear weapons, so to speak, right? I don't know how much a nuclear bomb costs, but I'll go ahead and just throw out a number. Let's say just making just a regular old drop from an airplane nuclear bomb cost $10 million. Let's just say $10 million. For $10 million, I can take out an enemy city. I can't do that with $10 million any other way. Think about how much it costs to get 1,000 soldiers. Now, what I mean by that is how much does it cost to train 1,000 soldiers? Then you've got to equip them. Then you've got to keep them ready. You've got to house them. You've got to feed them. You've got to put them in uniforms. You've got to give them tanks and grenades and bullets. A thousand soldiers are very expensive when you think about it and maintain that, right? Every year you incur that expense that you keep those 1,000 soldiers. I do understand the training is an upfront cost, but regardless, you've got to maintain 1,000 soldiers. It's going to cost you quite a bu bunch of money. That bomb, it's good for, I don't know, 15 years. You make a bomb and you can put it on a shelf and let it sit there for 15 years. Right? More bang for you. And I'm going to take out a city with a bomb that's $10 million. I'm not going to take out a city with a thousand soldiers. I could have a thousand Navy SEALs. I'm not taking out a city. Right? It's more bang for your buck. And so that's why Eisenhower said we can get a lot more done with nuclear weapons and it's cheaper. Right? It, it, you know, you just have to tailor make them, as we shall see in a moment. Also, Eisenhower was convinced that Korea was a valuable lesson. The United States could not contain communism by fighting a bunch of small wars everywhere. Because small wars, first of all, are unpopular. Okay, Small wars are unpopular. As we've already started to talk about with Korea, or as I talked about and when I uh, mentioned why it was the Forgotten War, if, you, if anybody actually watched that little presentation I did. Korea was not fun. I'm sorry, I don't know what other term to, to say. It wasn't popular. It wasn't satisfying, right? Fighting a limited war where instead of sending the entire might of the United States and an enemy, we're kind of playing with an arm tied behind our back. We're playing for limited objectives. That is not popular, and the people will not support those for long. And guess what? They add up. They get expensive. If you don't believe me, look at the bill that we've incurred in Afghanistan over the last almost 20 years. Okay. Now, here's a fun one you can do if you really want to, to dig deep. You can look at the average number of soldiers we've had in, Af in Afghanistan every year that we've been in Afghanistan. And then you look at the total amount of money we've spent in Afghanistan over that time period. And you're going to be like, oh, my goodness. Yeah. Small wars, while they might not involve a ton of troops, they do rack up quite the bill because war is expensive any way you slice it. And so, wars like that, like Korea, small wars, they are unpopular and they are expensive over time. And he said, instead, we need to prevent the war from ever occurring. Instead of going and fighting the small war, we need to make sure there never is a small war. And that's when he came up with massive retaliation. The best way was to basically just tell the communists, look, if you try anything, we'll use nuclear weapons. Just always throw out the nuclear threat. Just tell the Soviets, if you go into this country, we'll nuke you, right? We'll stop you with nuclear weapons. Um, that's the kind of threat countries aren't going to take lightly, necessarily. The New Look policy cut the budget by $16 billion. Eisenhower was able to take the United States military budget from $50 billion a year down to $34 billion a year. He cut, the, he cut the military's budget by about a third with this new policy. He cut the size of the army. Um, which is, again, a very expensive toy to have lying around. But at the same time, he increased our nuclear arsenal from roughly 1,000 nuclear weapons to 18,000 nuclear weapons. So here you go. When Eisenhower showed up, when Eisenhower left, you'll notice a dramatic increase in the size of America's nuclear arsenal. But it was cheaper than an army. If you're curious, here you go. This shows you all of America's nuclear weapons up until 2002. For those of you who are wondering what these different lines are, Red is everything we have, every single nuke imaginable. 
Strategic are the big ones that are designed to like blow up cities, right? Non-strategic are the smaller ones that you would, I don't know, fire out of an artillery gun or air-to-air -air, you know, missile or torpedo. And yes, we made all of those, right? So eventually we got to where, you know, you only need oh so many city killers. And then we built a bunch of fun different ones that we'll talk about briefly. Um, and as you can see, we peaked at over 30,000 nuclear weapons is my point. In the mid-1960s, America owned over 30,000 nuclear warheads, okay? For those of you who are also wondering what, you can take nuclear weapons apart, like any weapon. You can disassemble them. Speaking of mass retaliation, again, I will make a thing about um, the Cold War nuclear weapons separately, because this is usually like almost a half a day worth of lecture, and I want to keep this video shorter than an hour and a half. The wing of the United States Air Force that was responsible for our nuclear arsenal was Strategic Air Command, also known as SAC, because S-A-C. Tactical Air Command was known as TAC, okay? The military likes acronyms. Um, Strategic Air Command, their slogan, Peace is Our Profession. The symbol of Strategic Air Command is the armored gloved hand holding the lightning bolts of war, but also the olive branch of peace, right? These were the men and women who were responsible for training and preparing for nuclear war in case it ever occurred, right? This is what my father served in from 1954 till 1958. Now, for example, the B-36 Peacemaker, the world's first truly intercontinental bomber. Um, this thing could basically hit a target almost anywhere in the world if it was willing to go on a one-way mission. Um, it could definitely hit anything inside the Soviet Union. It's humongous. It's That's a B-29, the plane that dropped the bomb in World War II. Here's a B-36. It's like twice the size. It's enormous. But the early nuclear weapons were enormous. This thing could carry a couple of them. And here you go, more bang for your buck. This is what it takes to keep a B-36 flying, right? You got your maintenance crew, your flight crew, you need these trucks, blah, blah, blah. But think about it. This thing carries two nuclear weapons. It can take out two Russian cities. This one airplane can take out two Russian cities. All you're paying for is the airplane in this. Think of how many troops. Think of how many tanks. Think of how much it would cost regularly to take out two cities. And you can do it with just this. More bang for your buck. This is the B-47 Stratojet, the world's first swept-wing jet bomber. This is the plane that my father actually flew on. My father was in charge of arming the weapon and programming the bomb nav computer. He was stationed down here in the airplane. The pilot and co-pilot were up here. My dad sat down here. Yes, my dad could eject. This would blow off and he would get shot out the bottom of the airplane, which means my dad had a minimum ejection height, or he would lawn dart into the ground. If you don't know what lawn darts are, look them up. They're a toy from history. So, this thing is fast. It can fly over 600 miles an hour. But these are not fuel-efficient engines, so this thing had a shorter range. These had to be closer. So that is why my father and his unit would sometimes go to Greenland. And there was an Air Force base up in Thule, Greenland, um, the coldest place my father ever went to. The idea was Greenland was close enough that these planes could make it to the Soviet Union and drop their bombs. They couldn't fly from America to the Soviet Union. Or my dad went to Guam. There's an Air Force base in Guam, um, Anderson Air Force Base. They would be able to fly from Guam and hit targets in the Eastern Soviet Union. Some of these planes would even spend time at bases in Europe um, or Japan every now and again. Again, they've got to be closer. Some of you who know your airplanes might think, boy, that looks similar to another airplane um, we're going to see in a moment. This was a Mach 3 bomber, the B-58 Hustler. Um, this guy, again, can fly three times the speed of sound, so this, this guy could fly deep into the heart of enemy territory real fast, nuke him, and then fly on out. This was the prototype or the first model of a plane you might have seen, because it's still in the air today, the B-52 Stratofortress. Okay? The B-52, America's long arm for over 50 years. Matter of fact, the last B-52 made was made in 1963, which means the men and women who fly the B-52 today were not even born when the B-52 they are flying rolled off the assembly line. 
They have continued to update and modernize these aircraft and keep them viable. These planes were dropping bombs on Iraq in 1991 when I was a kid in the first Gulf War. These planes dropped bombs on Iraq in 2003 when we invaded then. Um, they're still in service today, and they have a massive bomb payload with bay where they can carry all sorts of different you know, weapons. And these can hit anywhere on the planet Earth, right, on a one-way mission if need be. Now, talking about more bang for your buck and options really quickly. You don't always want to blow up a city. Sometimes you want a smaller nuclear weapon, one that a fighter plane could carry. We did that. Sometimes you want one that a fighter plane or an aircraft carrier could carry. We did that, right? And again, these are smaller. They're still more powerful than the bomb we dropped on Hiroshima. Um, they can go up to one megaton. You know, the earliest thermonuclear weapons, the earliest hydrogen bombs were massive. They were like the size of a car, right? Like this one, 12 feet long, 4 feet in diameter, weighs 5 tons, but 25 megatons. That will mess you up, something fierce. I will make, I will put a link um, in my presentation on the Cold War. There's a website you can go to um, where basically you can, you can like pick the size of your nuclear weapon and decide where it falls and it will calculate, you know, how many people are injured, how many people are killed. It'll show you how far things are on fire, where the radiation will go. It's actually quite scary because like you take one of these weapons and you drop it on Cincinnati and then you see like people in Dayton are glowing, you know, and you're like, wow, that's pretty scary to think that we built these slightly smaller version. Uh, this one's actually on display up at the museum in Dayton at Wright-Patterson, if, if you're curious. Here you go. This is the estimate of a 5-megaton bomb dropped on Norwood, that neighborhood to the northeast of Cincinnati. Um, everybody in this area is dead. Um, even if you drop it in Norwood, which is several miles away from downtown Cincinnati, half of the people in downtown are probably dead. Most of downtown is probably destroyed. Over by Cuff Cath, like cars and stuff are flying through the air. Um, it's going to be bad. Now, we made a nuclear bazooka, kind of, sort of. Um, the idea was you could put this in the back of a truck or a Jeep. And a group of men could fire a small nuclear weapon at a bunch of enemy troops, right? And stop them. Even if you're outnumbered and outgunned, this would level the playing field. We made a backpack nuke for special forces. We did all kinds of crazy stuff, right? More bang for your buck. Oh, we made nuclear artillery. Yeah, we tested it. It's awesome. We made an air-to-air -air missile that was nuclear. The idea was if one airplane is trying to shoot down a bunch of enemy bombers, just fire a nuclear weapon at them. That'll take care of it. Right? We did it all. We made nuclear torpedoes. It, crazy. And there you go. For those of you who are curious about this chart that we looked at it a moment ago. All of these that I just showed you are non-strategic, right? The nuclear air-to-air -air missiles and nuclear artillery and nuclear torpedoes and the small bombs, the fighter planes, these are the those are all the ones I just showed you, right? We went crazy building those because if you're going to threaten to use nuclear weapons all the time, you need to have a bunch of different nuclear weapons, right? Nuclear weapons are like your toolbox. You need to have a different tool for every situation. And it's still cheaper than having all those soldiers, right? Now, this guy changed everything. You know, in 1955, we unveiled the B-52 bomber, which could fly across continents and drop nuclear bombs anywhere on the planet Earth, right? And it was very advanced. Um, the problem is bombers can be shot down. I mean, that's partially why we made the B-58. That's partially why we made this, this super speedster. You know, it's really hard to shoot down something flying three times the speed of sound, right? Um, but again, short range, because these engines just gobble fuel. So... The problem with bombers is while they're impressive and cool, they can be shot down. All right? And that's why both sides began developing what we call ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles. All right? Intercontinental ballistic missiles. Basically missiles. These could deliver a bomb anywhere in the world. We also began developing a way to fire missiles off of submarines. All right? You can't really shoot down a missile. Uh, I know right about now is when somebody would ask that in class. Is there a way to stop a nuclear missile? Not really. I mean, theoretically, sure. Um, has it ever been tried? No. And no one's really in the mood to run that test. 
Um, your odds of intercepting an ICBM are very low. There's a variety of reasons why. I, again, will cover that later or in a separate video. So everybody's developing rockets and missiles, right? And the Soviets shocked the world. On October 4th, 1957, they launched this, Sputnik, the world's first satellite. On October 4th, 1957, the Soviets fired this thing into orbit. For those of you who are wondering, it's roughly the size of a basketball. It weighs 187, it weighed 187 pounds. So it's basically a big metal basketball with long antenna. It beeps. That's all it did. It beeped. It sent out a radio signal. That way, the Soviets could tell if it had worked. That's all it was supposed to do, to prove that they could do it. They sent this thing into orbit, and it began circling the globe right up in space. And it scared the Americans silly. We took it as a sign that we'd fallen behind, that the Soviets had better stem, that they'd beaten us, right? We weren't able to put a satellite in orbit. Um, as some of you are like, it's just a beeping basketball. What's to say next week it's not a nuclear warhead that we can't shoot down, right? If they can put this into orbit, they can literally fire a nuclear missile at anything on the planet Earth. And so, you know, Eisenhower tried to play it down. He's like, I'm not worried about it. Members of Congress, on the other hand, completely freaked out. Um, we could not fall behind, right? For those of you who are still like, what's the big deal? Advertising, right? Uh, you know, I, I jokingly made the reference to STEM. It's important, right? It's important to show people you're on, you're on, you're ahead of it, right? You've got it. It's something there. People are interested in it. Think about if you're the United States and the Soviets, right? We'll make a metaphor. You're trying to get people to join your team, right? Just like you try and get students to come to your school. We're trying to recruit people. We got to show people we got the best. Right. We got to show them we got the best system. We got the best this, the best that. And the best science and technology is a big advertising thing. Right. The Soviets are able to say that they've got such advanced technology, they can put a satellite in space. What can the Americans do? Right. That's really bad if you're America. And so America freaked out. We could not fall behind the Soviets in this era, in this area, I should say. Uh, very quickly, we created NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, to coordinate rocket research and development and space exploration. We also very quickly passed the NDEA, the National Defense Education Act, which provided enormous amounts of funding to increase math and science and foreign language education in our country. Basically, the first STEM package. Right? And the space race will take place, but we're not covering that right now. Now, I mentioned using nuclear weapons. I mentioned uh, massive retaliation, how Eisenhower is always just like, I'll nuke you. It's called the art of brinksmanship, going to the brink of war, right? Basically going to the brink of nuclear war and forcing the other guy to back down, right? It's a game of chicken. It's a massive game of chicken. Secretary of State John Foster Dulles, a major figure in America's foreign policy in the 1950s. He was a strong believer in this, though. He said it was necessary. Um, he even said, of course, we were brought to the verge of war. The ability to get to the verge or brink without getting into the war is the necessary art. If you're scared to go to the brink, you are lost. Right? Think about it. Nuclear weapons, they are, there's no going back. Right? Everybody knows that. There's no going back. When you launch nuclear weapons, you're, you're all in. Right? If the enemy knows, you won't do it. If the enemy for a moment thinks you won't do it, your nuclear weapons are meaningless. The enemy has to think you will do it. You might not want to do it. It might be the very last thing you want to do on the entire planet Earth. But the enemy has to believe that you will do it. Otherwise, your nuclear weapons are meaningless. It's a hollow threat. Right. It's the age old um, cliche, you know, the, the, the father, they're driving to Florida, they're halfway there and the kids are whining and the dad does the whole if somebody says one more thing, I swear I'll turn this car around. No, you won't. And everyone knows you won't. OK, we've been in the car six hours. We're halfway to Florida. You're not going to turn around. OK, that's a stupid threat. No one believes you. All right. Similar concept. If you do one more thing, I will nuke you. If I know you're full of crap, if I know you're not going to nuke me, then it's a hollow threat, and I'm going to do it, 
right? You have to be willing to draw the line, and you've got to make the enemy believe you will do it. And that was one of the keys to Eisenhower. He understood how to do it, right? He was great at this. For example, the Korean War. During the presidential campaign in 1952, President, or excuse me, candidate Eisenhower promised he would go to Korea and find a solution to that situation. Americans were tired of Korea, and Eisenhower basically said, I will find a solution. And he said, I'll go there and, and see what's going on, right? Make sure what's going on. On December 4th, 1952, a month after winning the election, he went to Korea. He went to the horribly cold Korean Peninsula that winter, and he spoke to the generals. He even spoke to some of the troops and got their take and their opinion and their assessment. And he became convinced that this war was pointless. As he termed it, small attacks on small hills will not end this war. The president then quietly let it be known to the Chinese that the United States might have to continue the Korean War under circumstances of our own choosing. Hint, hint, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. We have nuclear weapons, you don't. Know. Right? Eisenhower just floated to the Chinese. Because the issue was the North Koreans didn't want to negotiate. The North Koreans were unwilling to really agree to anything. Um, and they were willing to keep fighting, hoping they could wear down America. And so China was like, yeah, I guess we'll back you. And America called up China and we said, look, we're sick of this. And we might have to change the game. And you will pay the price if we do. And what do you know? The Chinese told their North Korean allies, maybe we should make a deal. And in July of 1953, the two sides agreed to an armistice. We drew a division line, you know, a border called the Demilitarized Zone or the DMZ um, between the two countries. And they created a buffer region um, that neither one would really have control of. No military forces. Is it a victory? Not exactly. North Korea remained communist. They're still communist today, although they don't call themselves communist. They, um, they, they claim that they practice the ideology of self-reliance, or in their language, uh, gutcha. But anyhow, they're, they're basically a communist state still today. But guess who's not? South Korea. We contain communism. If you go to Korea to stop the spread of communism, then it is a victory, right? It's, it's not total victory, right? It's not like World War II parades in the street victory. But that's why, you know, again, depending on who you talk to, Korea was a tie, or some people say, no, we did what we wanted to do. We were fighting for a tie. Therefore, we accomplished our objectives. Korea is still divided today. There are still American troops in Korea today, a, a token force, a handful, but it's part of our commitment to basically curb any North Korean aggression. So it looks like brinksmanship helped end the Korean War. Not long after the Korean War ended, there was another crisis. The Chinese communists have control of mainland China, but remember, Chiang Kai-shek and friends ran to Taiwan, small and several small islands along the Chinese coast. In the fall of 1954, the Chinese threatened to seize some of the small islands that the nationalists lived on. And they actually also made rumblings about how they might go after Taiwan as well. We saw Taiwan as critical to our containment policy. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to click back. We're going to scroll back to this. We saw Taiwan as critical to America's containment policy, right? Here you go. Okay. Remember, if China has fallen to communism, then this little island, you know, Korea, Japan, Taiwan, our, our old colony, the Philippines, right, Australia, this is the way that we're going to try and contain communism, right? That's our wall. So Taiwan is a vital part of America's containment policy. Eisenhower was not about to sit back and watch the Chinese take out, you know, little old Taiwan. When the Chinese began shelling the islands that they were threatening and, and began to say that Taiwan would soon be liberated, Congress basically was, oh, excuse me, Eisenhower went to Congress and said, I need to use military force to defend Taiwan. We sent the United States Navy. We also began hinting we would use nuclear weapons if it came to that to stop a Chinese invasion. Like, we would nuke the Chinese invasion fleet. Like, if that's what it took. And the Chinese backed down. The year, the next year, a crisis erupted in the Middle East, the Suez Crisis. 
All right. Now, Eisenhower wanted to make sure that the Middle East did not turn to the Soviets for help. The Middle East was a part of the world which had recently gotten its independence after World War II. All those colonies that the Europeans had once had, all of them broke away or were granted their independence. So you got some young, lesser developed countries, and they need help. And we were afraid that in looking for help, these countries might turn to the Soviets. For example, Egypt. We wanted to help the Egyptians build up their economy and their infrastructure, and, and they needed a, a big power plant dam across the Nile River. We offered to help. We offered to help provide financial funding to help them build the dam. And so the grateful Egyptians eagerly accepted. It looked like we had a good friendship going. And then Congress found out that Egypt had previously bought weapons from the communist country of Czechoslovakia for their military. And when that word got out, Secretary of State Dulles had to withdraw the offer because Congress said no money for any country that supports communist weapon sales, right, or buys weapons from communists. And so John Foster Dulles had to go tell the Egyptians, um, remember that money we were going to give you? Yeah, we're not doing that anymore. A week later, the Egyptian army seized control of the Suez Canal. The Suez Canal had originally been built by the French. Um, <clears throat> And a French-British company had controlled the Suez Canal for the last almost century. The Egyptians took it away from those British and French companies, which owned it. They had all the legal rights to it. And they nationalized it, which means it now belongs to the Egyptian country, the Egyptian government and people. And their plan was to use the proceeds from the canal to pay for a dam on the Nile River. The British and French quickly responded. In October of 1956, they invaded Egypt in the area around Suez to basically reconquer the canal. Eisenhower was furious. Our allies did this without talking to us, without checking with us. The Israelis also helped, because why not? It's a chance to beat up one of their Arab neighbors. The situation became even more tense when the Soviets threatened rocket attacks on the British and the French and offered to send troops to help the Egyptians. You know, Eisenhower was, was angry. I mean, he was very upset because everything's messed up now, right? Obviously, the Egyptians are going to be furious at us because it's our allies attacking them, and we can plead ignorance, but no one's going to believe us. The, the Soviets look like the good guys because they're coming to help the poor Egyptians who just got attacked by these big European countries. Eisenhower, to get everybody to calm down, famously put America's nuclear forces on high alert and said if those fellows, meaning the Soviets, start something, we might have to hit them with everything in the bucket. We convinced our British and French allies to call off their invasion. And they did, and the Suez Canal went to the Egyptians. But it turned the Egyptians towards the Soviets for aid. And then all of the people in the Arab world basically turned to the Soviets for aid. This was a major blunder by our allies. It cost us. There's a reason why when we invaded Iraq those two times, a lot of the stuff we fought was made in the Soviet Union. The Soviets supplied a lot of the Arab armies during the Cold War because when our allies, the British and the French, attacked the Egyptians, everybody in the Arab world basically thought America was behind it. And everybody turned to the Soviets for help. So Syria, Iraq, Egypt, a lot of those countries got a lot of their equipment from the Soviet and a lot of support from the Soviets during the Cold War. Now, I mentioned trying to, you know, buy your friends like we did in Egypt with the dam. Yes, Eisenhower relied on brinksmanship, but he knew that wasn't always going to work. Sometimes... The enemy will call, sometimes you're just bluffing, right? Sometimes you are bluffing, and the enemy will call your bluff. Other times, you, you can't nuke. Like, what if it's a country, but there's a communist uprising? You can't nuke the communist in a country like, you know, South Korea. South Korea is our ally. Or Japan. Let's say Japan. Japan's our ally. And let's say that there was a communist uprising on one of the Japanese islands. Like, there's a communist revolution. I'm not saying Japan's communist. I'm saying that there's a bunch of revolutionaries, guerrilla fighters, terrorists. You can't go nuke a Japanese island and then expect Japan to be cool with it, right? And, okay, and that kind of defeats your objective. You're trying to save the country, not obliterate it, right? So nuclear weapons aren't always the answer, especially when fighting communist revolutionaries or guerrillas. To prevent communist uprisings, instead, you've got to get a little dirty. You've got to, you've got to use some black ops 
All right, you've got to use the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency, America's super secret dirty spy operations group, right? Uh, there was a movie with Matt Damon in the uh, early 2000s, The Good Shepherd, which kind of touched upon this. There have been a number of video games the past decade or so, including the Black Ops video games that touch upon the idea of, you know, some of these sensitive, off-the-record sort of operations. Many of our covert ops took place in developing countries. Why? They are prone to communism. Why? They're poor. Right? Communism appeals to poor people. Poor people have nothing to lose. They're already poor. You tell communists, you tell these people, excuse me, communists tell these people, we are going to take all the stuff from the rich people who, who by the way, got it through, you know, dirty deeds, right, and, and abusing the people. We're going to take all the stuff from them and we're going to distribute it to the people, right? We're going to spread the wealth. Sounds good to me. I don't have any wealth to give up, so I'm cool, right? A lot of these countries blame their problems on America and capitalism, right? We're poor because of, of European imperialism. We're poor because of colonialism. We're poor because of America, you know, and capitalism. And they take advantage of us, and they bully us, and they never treat us fairly. And the communists roll in and say, well, we're going to change all that, right? These people are ripe for communism. It's why, honestly, in a way... Touch it. I'll relate this to modern day. There's a reason why you have a lot of young Americans who, uh, when when polled or surveyed, are like, "Yeah, socialism doesn't seem half bad." Well, when you're 23 years old and you have no money in your bank account and you eat ramen noodles 24 times a week, right? And somebody walks up and says, we're going to tax the rich a whole lot and give the money to everybody else. You're like, that sounds like a good deal because I have no money. Meanwhile, a 55-year-old who spent the last 30-something years of their life working hard and building up their retirement fund and saving money and buying a house and blah, 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 they're not exactly thrilled at the concept of they're going to have to give everything up. Right? Similar concept. These people are ripe for the picking because communism appeals to the broken, the downtrodden, the angry, right? Now, we've got to prevent these people from going communist. One way you could do that is beat the Soviets to the punch and give them money, like Egypt, like we were going to in Egypt, right, with helping them build a dam. One way to fight communism is money. It's real simple, right? Just give people money and they won't go. We did it with the Marshall Plan. We rebuilt Europe's economy. No reason to go communist, right? Sometimes, though, you can't get there in time. Sometimes the Soviets beat you to it. Sometimes the revolutionary movement's too strong. Um, whatever. Okay? For example, Guatemala and Iran. Those are two great examples from the early Cold War where the CIA had to play dirty. All right, 1953. We've already talked about Iran, if you remember. It was one of the first things we talked about um, in 26.2, uh, right, with uh, containment. It was one of the first tests of containment. We've been supporting Iran for a while. Iran is our buddy. But in 1953, the Iranian prime minister, Mohammad Masenda, um, nationalized the Anglo-Iranian oil company, which means... He basically claimed dibs on a company that had been shared by the British and the Iranians, right? That they had made this as a team. And he said, nope, nope, it belongs to the people of Iran. You guys are out. Thank you for playing. And then it looks like he's going to make a deal to sell oil to the Soviets, right? It looks like he's going to take the company that now belongs to the government, and he's going to make a deal to sell oil on the cheap to the Soviet Union. He also made a move against the pro-American Shah, or King. That is the title of the leader of Iran, the Shah, back then, the Shah. He made a move against the pro-American Shah, forced him basically into exile. It looks like this guy is going to take control of Iran. Our Central Intelligence Agency, run by Alan Dulles, who was the brother of Secretary of State John Foster Dulles. That's right, the Dulles brothers were critical. In the early Cold War, you got John Foster Dulles serving as Secretary of State making some of these calls. You got his brother, Allen, operating behind the scenes at the CIA. Um, there's actually a book about these two um, that Mr. Muth's father actually uh, put me on to read about. It's quite interesting because, it's yeah, it's one of those 
history, most historians, most people don't know these these two really shaped an entire generation of American policy because of their positions. Like there's one that's in the spotlight and there's one behind the scenes kind of pulling the strings. But anyhow, the one at the CIA, Alan Dulles, engineered a bunch of street riots and a bunch of protests to overthrow the prime minister, Mosunda. Basically, the CIA went around and got anti-Mosenda groups and anti-communist groups, and in some cases just paid people, go in the streets, start throwing rocks, start burning stuff, start flipping cars, start protesting, start calling for the return of the Shah. This guy will lose credibility. He'll be gone. And we did. We basically removed him from power. The CIA rigged it to where this guy would get overthrown and we could bring back the Shah. Right? Even better example, Guatemala just down the street, right, in Central America. In 1951, Jacobo Arbenz Guzman won a presidential election in Guatemala. He won the election, but he won it with the help of communists. He had the backing and support of communists in Guatemala, and probably communists in other countries were helping fund it. Anyhow, he won the election in 1951. He then began to institute a land reform program where he would take land from large plantations and estates and corporations and redistribute it to the peasants, including land owned by the United Fruit Company, which was an American corporation, right, a U.S.-owned corporation, a company. So he took land from this American company and just gave it to the peasants. Not cool, man. In May of 1954, he went a step further and he negotiated the purchase of weapons from Czechoslovakia to arm the um, Guatemalan military. The CIA's answer was to start arming and training our own guerrilla armies in the jungles of neighboring Nicaragua and Honduras, and then provide them with a little bit of, of guidance when they launched a anti-Guzman invasion of Guatemala. Um, so we actually made our own guerrilla, clandestine, secret armies in neighboring countries. And when the time was right, we basically helped these people invade Guatemala to overthrow a man who won the election in Guatemala. Okay? Yeah, that's the kind of stuff we did. Now... <clears throat> In 1953, Joseph Stalin dies. And as, I, I, as I, I mentioned when we talked about the death of Vladimir Lenin previously, the Soviet system, unlike our system, our system's real simple. You've got president. If he dies, you go to vice. If he dies, you go to speaker, the, the president, pro tempore, the Senate. We got a very clear-cut line, right? No doubt about it. The Soviet system, you've got like six people who are all relatively equal in status, and there's no clear-cut succession. Every time somebody dies, there's a power struggle, right? Well, there's a power struggle after Joseph Stalin dies, and after about three years of struggle, a leader does emerge. Nikita Sergeyevich Khrushchev, right? Khrushchev not long after taking power, gave a speech. He gave a speech to the leaders of the Soviet Communist Party, right? He didn't give a speech to the public. He was in a room with basically the leadership of the Communist Party, and he gave a little speech. And in the speech, he criticized Joseph Stalin and what Joseph Stalin had done and the cult of personality that Joseph Stalin had created and some of the abuses of Joseph Stalin. And he also said that there are many ways to build a communist society that the idea that everyone has to be a satellite state and has to listen to the Soviets word for word and copy them and basically the Soviets bullying everybody doesn't have to be the way it's got to be. Now, that doesn't mean he wants to see communism fail. It doesn't mean he's surrendering. It doesn't mean he thinks the Cold War's over. It just means the idea that, like, Poland has to ask permission before they do anything to be true communist. He doesn't believe in that. He believes Poland can be independently communist. The CIA got a copy of this speech, don't ask how, and they began broadcasting it on the radio so that people in Eastern Europe could hear it. People in Eastern Europe heard it, and they began to protest and riot and demonstrate. Because here, the leader of the Soviet Union is saying that what the Soviets did in invading and conquering and forcing communism on Eastern Europe was not necessarily the right thing to do. 
there was a full-blown riot in the country of Hungary, um, where actually the communist government looked to be in danger of being toppled. To keep their satellite state alive, the Soviet army invaded. In October of 1956, you can see Soviet tanks roll into Budapest, and the rebellion is crushed. Right? The uprising in Hungary, gentlemen, forced Nikita Khrushchev to not be a friendly person and take a very hardline stance on things. Nikita Khrushchev is the man who made the Cold War the hotter. Okay? Yes, things were tense and uncomfortable with Joseph Stalin in the early years. Nikita Khrushchev is going to take it to a whole new level. Um, first of all, he's a hothead. Uh, the last couple of years, I've actually in some ways compared him to, to Donald Trump, or I've made comparisons in the fact that he says things you don't say, right? He's not afraid to get, to get dirty. He's not afraid to kind of throw inappropriate threats out um, or, you know, in his behavior. He, kind of, he takes people off their, off their game, right? For example, he's at a meeting in the United Nations. And a guy from England's given a speech, and in the speech he criticizes the Soviet Union a couple times. Nikita Khrushchev takes his shoe off and starts smacking it on the table loudly, interrupting the speech. Now, if you've never been to the UN um, meeting hall, if you've never been to the UN in, in New York, it, it's very cool. I don't know what the tour is like anymore. I, my last time doing any of this stuff in New York was pre-9-11. But the General Assembly is a massive, massive room, right? And things just echo. This guy starts banging his shoe as hard as he can on the table, and it's just this booming, echoing noise throughout the General Assembly. And everybody kind of looks at him, and the guy, you know, the British guy stops talking. Khrushchev puts his shoe on like nothing happened. The guy tries to repeat it. Khrushchev does it again, right? Um, after they launch Sputnik, he famously bragged to the newspapers, the United States now sleeps under a Soviet moon, right? And then he went on to say, whether you like it or not, history is on, is on our side. We will bury you, referring to the United States. My favorite, though, is one of his first meetings with John F. Kennedy. They're sitting there, right? And John F. Kennedy, um, basically, he's trying, to, he's trying to intimidate Khrushchev. And he says to him, you know, we have enough missiles to blow you up 30 times over. Or in that silly Bostonian accent of his, he delivered it. Khrushchev chuckled smiled, leaned forward in his chair, got really close to Kennedy and quietly said, we only have enough to blow you up once, but that's all we need, and leaned back, grinning. I mean, come on, man. That's awesome. He also one time told John F. Kennedy, we'll kick you so hard you won't remember your own name. So this guy is not a friendly, lovable, diplomatic fellow necessarily, right? He's aggressive. Um... <clears throat> He demanded, for example, the Allies withdraw troops from West Berlin. We, of course, rejected that demand. Um, you know, the relationship began to deteriorate, right? And Eisenhower could see that things were deteriorating. And so Eisenhower said, let's have a meeting. Let's have a summit. Let's get together in Paris. Let's sit down, have a little face-to-face -face chat. We'll work it out, right? We can come to some agreements. It's scheduled to take place in the spring, early summer of 1960 in Paris. Unfortunately, this guy gets shot down over a thousand miles inside the Soviet Union. His name is Francis Gary Powers. He's a former Air Force pilot who now flies for the CIA, flying the ultra-advanced spy plane, the U-2. The U-2 is basically a gigantic glider with a jet engine. It flies higher than any other airplane in the world back then. It even flew higher than any missile in the world could reach a target at that point. It could not be shot down. It was slow. It handled like a shopping cart. Right? It was not nimble. I mean, this thing is not uh, agile at all. It's a big hang glider. Right? But it flies so high, no one can touch it. So the Soviets knew it was up there. We kept flying them over the Soviet Union, taking pictures of everything, right? Spying on the Soviets, taking pictures of their test facility, their rocket facilities, their air bases. And they knew it was there because they could see it on radar, but they can't do anything because it's so high up in the air. And, of course, they didn't say anything because it's embarrassing, right? They're not going to tell the world America's picking on us. And unfortunately, right before the summit, we had one more flight scheduled. One more. And Gary Powers is going to do it. 
It's going to be the Grand Slam flight. He's going to fly from the Middle East through the heart of the Soviet Union, and then he's going to fly all the way up to, if I remember correctly, he was going to land at an air base in, like, Norway or something, or Finland, right? He's going to fly, I mean, over the heart of the Soviet Union. He gets shot down over the heart of the Soviet Union. The Soviets had actually custom-made an interception weapon to shoot him down. He ejects. He is captured. He does not take the suicide pill that he was supposed to take. He's captured. He also got blown out of, actually, the aircraft before he could arm the self-destruct button. So the airplane crashed, and parts of it were, were recovered. Well, he never made it back to base, so we knew something happened. All of a sudden, the Soviets are like, hey, did you guys lose an airplane? And we're like, oh, yeah, we had a high-altitude research airplane studying, like, the jet stream and cosmic radiation and stuff. Um, yeah, it took off from Pakistan. Um, and the pilot radioed he was having compass trouble and oxygen trouble. And, and it, yeah, did, did you guys find it? Because we thought he flew off course and crashed. And they're like, yeah, 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 we found it, we found it. Uh, well, we found some wreckage. We assumed it's yours. And it looks like it could be a high-altitude research plane. Are you sure it was a high-altitude research plane? Yeah, 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 yeah. Eisenhower told Khrushchev, oh, yeah, yeah, high-altitude research plane from uh, NASA. That's when Nikita Khrushchev said, funny. Um, yeah, we recovered more of the airplane than you thought we did. Um, we found a bunch of cameras inside of it, full of a bunch of pictures of our super-secret stuff. And that's when, you know, Eisenhower was like, ugh. And then Khrushchev was like, by the way, we have the pilot. His name is Francis Gary Powers, and he told us everything. And that's when Eisenhower probably dropped a lot of F-bombs. Um, the Soviets very quickly told the world how the United States was not only spying on them, but lied to them when confronted on it. The summit was immediately broken off. Khrushchev refused to meet with Eisenhower, and, you know, well, that that's that. If you're curious, Gary Powers was tried for espionage and convicted in a show trial. He was sentenced to serve, uh, I can't remember how many years of hard labor in a Soviet prison camp. We eventually exchanged him. Uh, we traded him for a Soviet spy we captured, brought him home. He, of course, never flew for the CIA again. Uh, if you're wondering what eventually happened to Gary Powers, he eventually died in a helicopter crash. He was flying a traffic helicopter for a Los Angeles TV station. When it ran out of fuel, there was a mechanical error or a mechanical problem, and he crashed his helicopter and died in a helicopter traffic helicopter crash in the 1970s. But anyhow, the failure of the summit with Nikita Khrushchev means the Cold War is actually going to get hotter, not cooler. And Eisenhower, uh, unfortunately, left the presidency... Um, convinced that he had failed in his effort to try and resolve the Cold War, or dial it down a notch, if you will. I do want to say before he left, Eisenhower gave us one last warning. Beware of the military-industrial complex. What is he talking about? He's talking about the growing relationship between the military establishment, right? The Pentagon, the Department of Defense, and all the politicians involved in that and American industry. He said that we were creating a dangerous marriage, that more and more of America's economy was being tied to defense spending, and that this defense spending was obviously being driven by the generals and the Defense Department and senators and congressmen, and etc. And it was becoming its own world, right? That a large chunk of America's budget was becoming tied up in military spending, a large part of our economy, tens of thousands of jobs, right? And that basically it was becoming a vital part of America that we could not get away from. And he was warning that it was going to potentially wreck us, right? And that we would lose some of our democracy and freedom to this growing influence of the generals and the Pentagon and the people who supplied them. You know, more bang for your buck, yes, was cheaper. But think of all those things I showed you. All right? There's a company that's making a lot of money off of building these, and they want to keep those contracts flowing. Right? There's a company making these aircraft. It's a different company. They want to keep making them. All right? This is a different company. You know, actually, this is the same company that makes this. But, you know... A lot of money in these, a lot of money in these, you know, people are making money developing and building these, and these are just a few examples, right? Think of all the warships, 
Think of all the submarines. Think of all the aircraft carriers. Think of the U-2 spy plane. All these things, big bucks, lots of jobs, right? For example, a lot of my relatives worked in the shipyard, Ingle Shipyard in Pascagoula, Mississippi. I would say during the Cold War, 80% of the work in Pascagoula was making warships, right? If those companies don't get those contracts to make those warships, everybody down in that part of Mississippi and Louisiana loses their job, which is actually sort of true. When the Cold War ended and those contracts dried up, a lot of my relatives lost their jobs because they didn't need welders in the Pascagoula shipyards, right? Um, there were a lot of companies. Their entire existence was tied to defense spending. And Eisenhower could see it. He could see what was occurring. And you got senators who were going to fight to keep those jobs in their states, right? Because they want to get reelected. So he warned us about it. But Eisenhower, for all of his warning, one of the final things he said is, I confess I lay down my official responsibilities in this field with a definite sense of disappointment. I wish I could say that a lasting peace is in sight. The Cold War is not going anywhere, kids. And in fact, in the early 60s, it's going to go to its hottest temperature ever, arguably. Um, but that is a, a story we will talk about another time um, because I, I'm going to just wrap up 26 where it wraps up. Uh, I will make a video about nuclear weapons in the Cold War a little bit and talk about some of those things in a little more detail that I really gloss through. Some people get interested. If it doesn't float your boat, you know, no harm. It's just for your viewing pleasure. Um, from here, we're going to go to Chapter 30, and we're going to uh, learn about why America went to Vietnam. And it's all about the Cold War, and it's all about containment. And again, that's why I'm doing it now, because it seems silly for us to talk about a few other things and then magically throw Vietnam in there when it's really just another example of containment. And it actually goes in nicely because Vietnam really starts in the early 60s, and that's where we're leaving this right now. But again, that is for another lecture.